spell, Prophet's spell. It's indeed an honor to have you here, and uh, uh, I consider myself very lucky that I am in presence of a professor who was very near to David Bohm, whom I admire very much, uh, especially for splitting the Schrodinger equation into classical and non-classical, and bringing out this new way of looking at physics. Uh, which actually points towards consciousness and uh, conscious experience, if you like. Um, so uh, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself more uh, to the world at large, <laughs> um, where you work and where, which university you are at. Okay, so, uh, so I'm an uh, associate professor in, in uh, uh, theoretical philosophy at the University of Skövde, Sweden. Sweden. Okay. We have a department of uh, cognitive neuroscience and, and philosophy there, but I'm, I'm more of a philosopher. And, and then I then I also work work part time at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Helsinki. Helsinki, okay. So that's a big philosophy department. Uh -huh. and, uh, so anyway, yeah. so I am kind of kind of uh, in in those two two countries, Sweden and, and Finland are. Finland, okay. That's, I'm up there. Well, at least they're near each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're they're near <laughs> each other. And, uh, okay, so let me ask you uh, to start with how how did you get interested in uh, David Bohm's work? Well, well, it was. Uh, Around uh, maybe 79, 1980, I was actually studying philosophy at the University of Uppsala. But at the same time, looking into broader things, and, and a friend of mine was interested in Christian Murdy, and, 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 and I, I read that and became very interested in that. And through that also, then I, 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 I noticed uh, David Bohm. I mean, otherwise, he wasn't that well known mm -hmm. at, at the time, but, uh, and, and, and then gradually started reading his work. And, and, and so. So then, and then went to England and studied there and, and got to know him a little bit better. And okay. so, but I, I understand David Bohm also was, was, he, was Krishnamurti his mentor or something? Well, it's difficult to say in a way. I guess you could say that. Of course, they had a lot of this discussion. So, okay. you, so you could look at it as, as a kind of a dialogue or discussion between a scientist and, and then, then a kind of teacher, something like Leibniz's philosophy or philosophy of life. I mean, I think Bohm was very struck by by, uh, by Krishnamurti's some of Krishnamurti's ideas, and and uh, and I think he felt Bohm felt that perhaps what Krishnamurti had to say could be important for for society and the world at large. So they had many many dialogues. Okay. Yeah. You know, of course, then you can ask what, what, whether there was that kind of personal dimension there as well. Well, but uh, but I, I guess if you if you read uh, David. Pete's biography. Okay. It's called the Infinite Potential. That also gives a kind of a description of, of uh, Bohm's and, and uh, Christian Murdy's interaction. Okay. Wait, were you uh, colleagues, David Pete, and there was another gentleman by the name of Basil Basil Haley? Well, well, it sort of worked worked out. Uh, how would you put it? I mean, uh, were you in the same sort of era? Yeah. Well, same same area. You could say that. But uh, in in the mid 1980s i was then i was at the university of sussex and then i was interacting with bohm who was uh, I at the university of london berkeley college berkeley, and then yeah. it was through a little bit later it was probably around maybe 91 that uh, bohm introduced me to to basil highly then okay and and we became uh, good sort of how would you put it sort of colleagues and, and friends i mean I, I later on i did a postdoc at berkeley college with the uh, British Academy and Academy of Finland, kind of an exchange yeah. Yeah. grant, and, and so Basil was supervising me, and we did some some articles together. May I guess we had done maybe three or four art joint articles, and okay. uh, and we still interact. So I, I be, you know, I, but so I learned tremendously also from Basil, Basil highly, and and, uh, and enjoyed working okay. with him very much. And uh, with David Pete, I, I I guess you know I I, I met him. Somewhere in the mid 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 eighties as well, and and we met in number of occasions, and I enjoy very much, you know, yeah. whenever there's a chance to discuss sure. with him. And uh, where is he at the moment? Is he in Italy somewhere? Yeah, he's in Italy. Okay. He's got a research center in Pari, and okay. uh, and you know, Bohm and uh, Pete made yeah. this book, Science, Order, and Creativity. Mm -hmm. I think it was published in 1987, wow. and uh, so I was in a team who translated that into Finnish, and I still use that as a course book in one course that I do via the University of Skövde. It's kind of a distance course, and it, it's called uh, uh, creativity and science. So, in that sense, uh, you know, I, I, uh, uh, Bohm and Pete are sort of important okay. because uh, I think their their book has great value, and I think uh, most students who who take the course are really really uh, 
sort of touch and affected and impressed by, by, you know, it opens up this new way of thinking yeah. about... Uh, what is, is it to do with activity, information, well, and form it, and all Well, that? it has to do with the nature of science. I think Bowman P, they are, they are, they are proposing a view of science as that science could be co constantly creative. It's a little bit like Popper had also that same idea. Mm -hmm. And whereas quite an, another quite popular view is to think that science is, is, tends to be you know, you have normal science, uh, which is more sort of the nitty-gritty work, and then, you know, from time to time you have revolutions if there are very strong anomalies. So, so that's the Kuhn view of the paradigms. You know, have a certain paradigm, and then there's a paradigm shift. And, and I mean, Bohm and Peeth, they, they do acknowledge that in science, they call it the tacit infrastructure of ideas that prevails in science. And this, this is a bit like a paradigm that really affects everything we do in science. It could have, you know, it, it determines the sort of questions we ask and the sort of experiments we make. And so usually so people are not aware of it. So that's a bit like the paradigm. But I, but I think what Bohm and Pete were advocating was the possibility of constant creativity rather than having to wait for a paradigm shift and then having a long period of, if you like, uncreative science. Yeah. So, you, you, so what you're saying is physics may play a very uh, important role in the... Uh, idea of conscious experience through quantum, quantum mechanics? Well, yeah, that would be moving on to another other topic then, if, if one would look at the in, in, in relation to consciousness. But, uh, yeah, we could, you know, if you want, we can talk about that. Yeah, sure. Let's, let's see how, how do you think physics will actually uh, uh, play a part, because there was Bohm there with a, uh, a great physicist who knew about quantum mechanics and also Einstein's theory of relativity and and he somehow came up with a solution how to sort of combine these two opposing theories. Um, could, could you throw some light on it, how he managed to do that? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, that would be then the, the work with the implicate order. But perhaps before we move into that, I could say a little bit about something more general about, sure. about the uh, this issue of consciousness. Because, I mean, you know, to begin with, it might seem that uh, consciousness and, 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 and quantum theory would have very little to do with each other because, you know, quantum theory is when we study at the atomic level and, and uh, you know, very small energies in special circumstances. And, and then, uh, you know, consciousness seems to be at the, if you like, entirely other level. It, it's the, it's of course our everyday experience, but then, you know, we, we feel that it's, it's related to brain processes at the macroscopic level. So I think the most people would think that uh, that uh, quantum theory has very little to do with with conscious experience. I mean, I would that's probably the the mainstream view. Now, but then you could ask, well, why do some people suggest that quantum theory and consciousness are related? Because actually, that idea was there from the very beginning. I think already in the 1920s, okay. uh, uh, you know, people what? like some of the founders of quantum. Theory. Like people like Niels Bohr, perhaps, but also others, they felt there's a kind of a connection between, others, yeah, there's a connection between, between quantum theory and mind. Mm. And you see, one reason could be that there's, in some ways, analogies. There's some analogy between certain kinds of quantum processes and then mental processes. Okay. And here we, are not, we don't have to even talk about conscious experience as such, but mind in general, whether it's, okay. you know, unconscious or conscious mind. And, and you see, I think one of the analogies is that in you know in quantum mechanics we have this feature that that uh, uh, it relates to so-called uncertainty principle, which is roughly that if you uh, want to measure uh, the momentum of the particle, mm -hmm. which is sort of related to the velocity, mm -hmm. uh, then if you do that measurement, you 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 look you don't know anything about the position right. where it is, yeah. and vice versa. If you want to measure the position of of uh, a particle, then you have no idea where it's where it's going, so to speak. Is that the, and the little incremental part of the Planck's constant. And yeah. and you see, yeah, and and then now Bohm, in his 1951 book Quantum Theory, he, he suggested that this is this seems to be an analogous to our process of thought in the sense that, that if we say that uh, the content of thought is analogous to to the position of the particle, and uh, if you like the direction of thought, it would be be uh, analogous to the momentum of the Moment. particle. Okay. So, so the analogy would be that if you, you know, if somebody is, is engaged in a train of thought and you ask them to tell, you know, what are you thinking about, like define the content, doing that will, if you like, pr you know, prevent 
the, the, the momentum of that thought or the movement of that thought because instead of that thinking process moving as it was, it now Disturbed. changes and starts you know, defining the content. Okay. So, uh, so this is a sort of, a, it, of course you could say these are rough analogies, but they're kind of suggestive in, in the sense that, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, you know, what people, who, people like Baum who really thought about quantum theory greatly deal, he wrote one of the best textbooks really trying to get the, not just the mathematics but also the physical meaning of it. I think then he felt that, he felt these analogies that they are fairly strong. And, and now, now the next step would be say, well, what about, you know, is this such an analogy or could, could there be a reason for the analogy? Now, and, and if there were, well, how would you explain it? And, and one of the options that I think in some sense Niels Bohr but also David Baum then explored was that, uh, that let's assume that the uh, you know, could it be the case that the neural processes underlying thought involve some quantum uh, okay. effects? Right. This might be in the synapses, or who knows, today we might say it could be in the microtubules. Yeah. And if so, that could give an actual explanation for, for this kind of, uh, if you like, like uh, this, this sort of uh, influence, influence of, of, you know, when we attempt, when thought attempts to observe itself, that, that you have these inevitable changes. Now, there could be other, there could be classical explanations as well. I mean, you know, you could have feedback loops in, in the classical yeah. level, but, but anyway, this was the way, I think Niels Bohr speculated that thought mm -hmm. might involve, involve such small amounts of energy that okay. quantum mechanical limitations come into play. This uh, is in the cognition neural processes. Yes, process. that's right. That's, that's when we're talking yeah. about, about really the, you know, the physical aspect of thought. Right. And, and uh, right. now that's just one example. I'm, and, and, um, and therefore, for, uh, but that, uh, that gives an explanation why, why certain people have been attracted. It's an example of why people have attracted the idea that, that uh, thought processes and, and uh, quantum processes are related.